Hello, my name is Matthew Nock. I'm a professor at the Department of Psychology at Harvard University, and I'm really excited to be able to talk with you all today about the topic of suicide and the use of new technologies to better understand, predict, and prevent suicidal behavior. I'm going to be talking about using new technologies to better understand, predict, and prevent suicidal behavior. So why spend time talking about suicide or thinking about suicide? It's a very, um, to many, distressing topic, uh, stigmatized topic. Quite frankly, uh, quite simply, this is a really complex problem, and it's something that has plagued us as humans for literally thousands of years. So it's something that we as humans have been thinking about and studying for a really long time. For, for many, many years, this is a problem that fell in the domain of philosophical inquiry and, and virtually every major philosopher over the years has, has thought about and written about the question of um, should one live or die. It's only been the past hundred years or so that uh, medical sciences have focused on this question, on this problem, and we haven't made much progress. Whereas advances in um, medicine and um, implementation science have led to huge decreases in the mortality rate associated with many leading causes of death, heart disease, cancers, pneumonia, accidents, and so on. This is not true for suicide. There's been literally no significant change in the suicide death rate over the past 100 years. It's the same right now as it was 100 years ago. And it remains in the US the 10th leading cause of all death and the second leading cause of death in those ages 15 to 34 years behind only accidents. Over the years, we have made some progress. We've identified key risk factors. We have some promising interventions. But I would argue that progress has been slow and in many ways stagnant. I know some of my colleagues uh, working in this area would, would disagree. And I'm reminded of uh, a quote from W. Edwards Deming, who said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. And so I want to share some data to address this question of how well have we been doing at predicting suicidal outcomes. And what I want to share briefly are results from a meta-analysis that uh, our research team recently completed, led by um, Joe Franklin and others. And what this meta-analysis looked at, among other things, is our risk factors for suicide attempts and suicide deaths shown here over the past 50 years to, to test, are we getting better at identifying people at risk for suicide or, or more specifically, are we identifying more powerful risk factors? So from left to right here, we have the passage of time binned into four, four bunches. The first one captures 20 years because there weren't that many studies over that period. And cases here refers to how many analyses are included. And on the vertical axis, what I wanna show are odds ratios. So roughly what is the increase in odds or likelihood of a suicidal outcome given the presence of some key factor? We would hope that these odds ratios would increase over time from left to right. But what we see is they don't. It looks like they're coming down, although probably more, more even over time. You see these error bars getting more and more narrow. And we see we do have some significant risk factors for suicide, but there hasn't been a big improvement over time in the power of these associations. Why might this be? Well, it turns out that we've largely been looking at the same risk factors over and over and over again. So in each of these roughly decade categories, we listed here the top five categories of risk factor examined, and they're the same in every decade. They switch a little bit in their order, but in every decade, we look at sociodemographic factors like age, race, ethnicity, gender. We look at DSM internalizing and externalizing symptoms. We look at prior self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, and we look at negative stressful life events. And in fact, in about 75 to 80% of all the analyses we've done, we've looked at one of these five factors. And so then perhaps through this lens, it's not so surprising that if we're looking at the same predictors and we're largely using the same methods, self-report surveys, uh, interviews, we shouldn't be surprised that we're getting the same results over and over again. We're not improving our ability to predict suicidal outcomes. Frankly, we need new approaches. So what new approaches might we use? What I'm arguing is that we should use advances in technology to try and get better at understanding and predicting and preventing suicidal outcomes. Why advances in technologies? Quite simply, advances in technology have, have really transformed how we do most other things in life. If we think about, for instance, how we solve complex mathematical problems, for a really long time, up until fairly recently, we used technology that looked like this to solve complex math problems. And I remember in my early grade school years using an abacus to solve math problems. 
And now, of course, we have supercomputers that can solve complex math problems really quickly. And this has changed virtually every aspect of how we live our lives. If we think about how we travel for a really long time, up until fairly recently, if we want to move from one place to another, attend a conference, for instance, we used technology that looked like this. And now over the past few decades, we of course have advances in technology that can transport us all around the globe, uh, advances in technology that, that bring us um, via Zoom or other, other tools to one another. And so this has totally changed the way that we move around and interact with others. If we think about closure to the, the point of this conference, medical sciences, for a really long time, if we had a serious medical problem, let's, let's say we lost a limb, this was our most um, cutting edge technology. And in the past few years, we now have robotic arms that are controlled by the human brain. Really incredible advances in our abilities to help other humans. Now moving to the realm of mental health, if we think about how we identify and treat those with serious mental health problems, for thousands of years, we did this by sitting down and talking with others. And now with advances in mental health, we're still largely using the same approaches. So I would argue that the time is right now for a convergence between the study and treatment of admittedly really complex problems and the use of new technologies and advances in computing to help us better study and treat these problems. So what might this look like? There's of course lots of different directions that one could go in. What I'm proposing is not to use some new technology simply because it's new and cool and, and, and might be fun to implement, but instead that we've been driven largely by gaps in our understanding. And I'm gonna talk about three key gaps in the understanding of um, suicide and related outcomes and how some new technologies are improving understanding, prediction, and prevention. First, I wanna talk a little bit about how we need, and in recent years we've seen the development of new methods for combining information about known risk factors. I'll then talk about how we need and have developed uh, objective measures for, for capturing suicidal thoughts. Generally, if we wanna know clinically if someone's thinking about suicide, we, we ask them, uh, we don't have, we haven't had the same objective tools that we've had in other areas of medicine, um, x-rays, blood tests, uh, heart monitors, and so on. And in the past few years, researchers have developed ways of capturing suicidal thoughts without relying on a person reporting them verbally. And finally, I'll talk about the need for, uh, and recent advances in, collecting data on imminent risk. The need to understand, is this person, is this patient in front of me going to try and hurt themselves or kill themselves right now in the next hours, days, weeks, and so on. And I'll spend maybe 10 minutes talking about each of these and then close with some, some limitations and future directions. So first, in terms of the need for combining information about risk factors, we have identified, as I mentioned earlier, some key risk factors for suicide. Thinking back to the meta-analysis I mentioned earlier, this is a list of the strongest risk factors over the past 50 years for suicide death. We see that treatment history is the most powerful with an odds ratio of about three, perhaps not because treatment is our treatments are harming people, but because those who are most clinically severe find their way into treatment. After that, all of our odds ratios are about equal uh, with an odds ratio of about 1.5, which means that each, each of our most powerful risk factors ticks up a person's risk just a little bit. There's no one risk factor that really puts a person at risk. Instead, suicide, as we understand it, occurs from the interaction of a number of different factors. We haven't though understood how those factors combine to increase a person's risk because literally 99% of studies that have been done to understand risk factors for suicide have looked at one risk factor at a time. So a study or an analysis within a study might look at the association between depression and suicide attempts, substance use and suicide attempts, domestic violence and suicide attempts. How then should a clinician measure all of these different risk factors, weight them, combine them, and make a prediction about a given patient's risk of suicide attempt. But the human brain isn't designed to do that. Your, your clinician in a clinical setting doesn't have the, the time, not, let alone the ability to do that. So we need methods of, of measuring and combining risk and protective factors much more quickly. With advances in computing uh, and, and, and technology, we're starting to be able to do that. I'm gonna show one example uh, of a study led by Ron Kessler as part of the Army STARS initiative. So in this study, what the researchers wanted to do is predict which patients are gonna die by suicide in the year after psychiatric hospitalization. We know from, from, from decades of research that 
the weeks and months after discharge from a psychiatric hospitalization is one of the highest risk times for suicide death. What we don't know is which of those patients are most likely to die by suicide over that period. So in this study, the researchers used machine learning applied to medical and administrative data to create risk scores for suicide death over the next year. And they did this in over 50,000 hospitalizations over a six year period, again, among army soldiers. So in a nutshell, what was done, not a single army soldier was talked to by researchers in this study. What the research team did was look at that, each patient's medical record, look at their digital records, use them um, to generate a risk score and test that risk score in another sample of data. So we looked at risk scores for over 50,000 hospitalizations. Each hospitalization gets a roughly predicted probability of making a suicide attempt or dying by suicide over the next year. And what I wanna show are how those risk scores line up from left to right here are high risk groups. So the, the, the one here represents the top 5% of risk scores. The two is the next 5% of risk scores and so on and so forth. And on the vertical axis are the percentage of suicides falling into each of those bins. What we hope to see is most of the suicides occurring among the highest risk groups on the left. And that is in fact what we see. And in fact, that first ventile, the top 5% of risk uh, captured more than half of all suicides. So whereas the suicide rate in the army is 18 per 100,000, in this top risk group, in this top bin, the rate was 3,800 per 100,000. So a huge concentration in risk in that top bin. On the flip side, this is about 4,000 per 100,000 or about four per 100. So what this means is in this high risk bin, only about four patients out of every 100 who we said are at risk actually died by suicide. So 96 out of 100 didn't die by suicide. So that's a lot of false positives. And that might lead one to say, well, this isn't really actionable. This is leading to way too many false positives. Interestingly though, in this high risk group, in this top 5% of scores, nearly half of all people in this group, if they didn't die by suicide, they died by accident, they had a, another, uh, they had a suicide attempt, or they had a re-hospitalization, which suggests that maybe this approach is actionable. If we can identify a small portion of patients for whom half are gonna have a negative outcome in the next year, this suggests that we should probably start targeting this group with interventions to try and drive down risk of this range of outcomes. An important take home from this is, uh, risk models for suicide also are risk models for a number of different outcomes. A lot of these negative outcomes tend to cluster together. Importantly, this is all done with data lying dormant in patients' medical and administrative records. And so again, it doesn't take any human resource to, to, to generate these risk scores other than the, doing the analyses. This is true in the Army. Is this true more generally? Well, other research groups have shown, um, Barack Corn and colleagues showed that in the Harvard healthcare system, uh, this group used machine learning on electronic health records and generated uh, using different uh, algorithms generated similarly accurate risk scores that could identify suicide attempters on average about three years before the suicide attempt occurred. And the same group replicated this in five different civilian healthcare systems around the country, finding pretty consistent results in terms of having accurate models to identify those at risk for suicide uh, well in advance of their suicide attempt, suggesting that with advances in technology, we can in in healthcare systems, in, in military systems, find people at risk for suicide attempt and suicide death well in advance of those behaviors, perhaps providing an, uh, an ability to intervene. One can do even better, we recently learned, by combining information from a number of different sources. Uh, our most recent work in this area, we used machine learning on electronic health records, combined that with a brief patient iPad-based survey, so we set up shop in a, in a Harvard hospital and assessed suicide risk among 2,000 patients presenting to an emergency department with a psychiatric complaint, followed them for the next month to see can we improve prediction of who makes a suicide attempt. So we, again, used machine learning applied to health records, gave each patient uh, a, a tablet, an iPad, that had a small handful of self-report questions, and we asked their clinician, what's the likelihood this person's going to make a suicide attempt in the next month? and we combined all these sources of information. What we found is that unfortunately clinicians, I'm a clinician myself, were not much better than chance at predicting which patients are gonna make a suicide attempt. So what I'm gonna show are some AUCs or area under the curve. These range from zero to one, 0 0.5 is no better than a coin toss. Uh, 0.67 is, is not so much higher. If we use machine learning applied to health records, 
we can improve prediction a little bit. If we combine machine learning with patient self-report, we get our best prediction. Uh, and and that, that predictive ability doesn't improve further if we add clinicians' estimates. And whereas in the prior slide, I showed results from a study where the high-risk group captured 4% uh, or 4% of people in the high-risk group made a suicide attempt. In this study, combining these, these, these data and using a slightly larger risk band, we can capture, of those we said are at high risk, 30% make a suicide attempt in the next month. So if we're able to find a high-risk group where one in three are gonna make a suicide attempt in the ne next month, this becomes even more clinically actionable. And I'll note that the self-report measure here, um, we're able to, with just 20 items, have a risk score that's as predictive as using a, almost 100 items. And this, in terms of patient completion, takes only about four minutes to do. So pretty quickly in an ED setting, we can generate risk scores for each patient that clinicians can then use to help their clinical decision-making. And we've begun this past summer um, implementing this in local hospitals, trying to work this into clinicians' workflow with the hope of, of, of trying to use these results to actually improve clinical care. I wanna switch gears now and talk a little bit about the need for objective markers of suicide risk. So current assessment methods are largely limited to reliance on explicit self-report. Meaning if we want to know if a patient or a person in general is at risk for suicide, we ask them, are you thinking about death? Are you thinking about suicide? Do you have plans to kill yourself? And we should do this because we've learned from decades of research that about two thirds of people who die by suicide told someone ahead of time that they were thinking about death or suicide. So we should ask people about suicidal thoughts. And if they say yes, we should take that seriously. We also know, however, that, that we can't rely only on people's self-report. Doing so is problematic for a number of reasons. We know that people have an obvious motivation to deny or conceal thoughts of suicide in many cases to avoid being hospitalized or, or otherwise intervened upon. We also know that suicidal thoughts are often transient in nature. And I'll talk more about this in a moment, but suicidal thoughts can be absent when we ask a person about them, but they may return or may have an onset uh, minutes, hours, weeks later. We also know from decades of research in cognitive and social psychology that we all lack conscious awareness of factors influencing our behavior. And so we may not be all able to accurately uh, report on what we're gonna do in the future in terms of suicide. We know these things are problems because whereas 66% of people who die by suicide told someone ahead of time that they were thinking about suicide, 78% of people who die by suicide in the psychiatric, in, in a hospital, explicitly deny suicidal thoughts or intentions in their last communication before dying. And this is a common quandary that probably many, if not most of you have, have experienced, where we have patients who are inconsistently reporting on their suicidal thoughts. What we really need are methods of assessing suicide risk that don't just rely on what a person tells us. So more concretely, we have a person in front of us, patient, friend, colleague, family member, who's saying, I don't want to kill myself. What we often really wanna know is what might this person be thinking that they're not telling us? What are their unspoken thoughts or their implicit cognitions as we think of them? Uh, implicit cognitions are those that don't rely on contents of our mind that don't rely on conscious introspection or explicit self-reporting. Over the past few years, cognitive and social psychologists have developed ways of measuring implicit cognition uh, that don't rely on self-report. They use tests of memory or reaction time uh, to get a sense of what what, is, what are the contents of a person's mind? What associations are they holding in mind? And they've done this using a range of methods. One that I'm gonna talk about and show some data from is called the Implicit Association Test or IAT. This is a brief reaction time test that asks a person to classify words or stimuli that they see appear on a screen. And it uses the speed with which you made these classifications to understand how you think about different constructs of interest. So it's been used by, um, largely by social psychologists to understand how people think about different groups. For instance, um, men versus women, old people versus young people, black people versus white people, Republicans versus Democrats, and so on. And the test operates like this. You're asked to make a classification of different words or stimuli that you see appear on the screen. I'll give a very simple example. You'll see uh, words appear that are, or images appear that are either basketball players or jockeys. And what I want you to do is you'll have two buttons on a keyboard and you'll classify basketball players on the left side of your screen, jockeys on the right side of your screen. 
I'm also gonna show you tall related words and short related words. And I want you to put tall words on the left with basketball players and short words on the right with jockeys. And I'll intersperse these different kinds of words and images and ask you to make these classifications as quickly as you can. Let's say we'll give you 50 trials and then we'll, we'll measure your response time in milliseconds. You'll be pretty quick pairing those things because you probably think about basketball players as being tall and jockeys as being short. Then we'll do another block of trials where we'll have you put basketball players and short words on the same side and jockeys and tall words on the other side. And you'll do the same task. Well, chances are you'll be a little bit slower on that task because you don't associate those things as being like each other. So it takes a little bit more mental effort. If we take your, react your average reaction time from the consistent pairing, subtract from it your reaction time for the inconsistent pairing, and divide by the standard deviation of all your responses, we'll get a measure of how much you associate basketball and tall and jockey and short. Of course, if you've never seen or heard of basketball players or jockeys, you would show no, no, no difference in, in your reaction time. The more familiar, the more you associate those things as being like each other, the faster your, your or the bigger your difference. So we took the same concept, the same test, and we applied it to the measurement of how people think about life and death. And so instead of basketball players and jockeys, we use the concepts of life and death. And instead of tall or short, we use the attributes of, is it like me or is it not like me? And so I'm gonna show you an example of what this test looks like. Uh, the, the, and the point here is to see to what extent does someone identify themselves, me, as being like life versus with, with death. So the test looks like this. I, I'll invite you to play along while you watch this. I'm gonna show stimuli in the middle of the screen. And if it is a death or me related word, I want you to say out loud, if you can, left. And if it's a life or not me related word, I want you to say outside, right. So suicide is a death related word. So left, left, right, right, right. Okay, so let's pretend you went through 50 trials. Now we'll switch. Now instead of death being paired with me, life is paired with me. We'll go through the same exercise. Left, right. Okay, hopefully we're slightly faster on that second pairing when life and me were paired than on the first. We took this test and we set up shop in a local emergency department and administered it to patients passing through the emergency department, got their score, and then filed them over the next six months to test how well does this score on, a, on this test do in predicting who makes a suicide attempt. And what we found was for those who are faster responding when life and me are paired, 10% made a suicide attempt over the next six months. For those who are faster responding when death and me are paired, they had three times the rate of suicide attempt in the next six months. And we found that performance on this test had incremental predictive validity in predicting the occurrence of suicide attempts above and beyond commonly used factors that, that clinicians use to make these predictions. It's like chart diagnosis of say depression, clinicians prediction, again, they were no better than chance in this study either, patients own prediction and a measure of um, suicide severity the severity of suicide ideation is the Beck scale with a, with a pretty big odds ratio for the IET with decent sensitivity. So we captured half of suicide attempts and even better specificity. Replication is of, course, uh, is of course very important in science. And so we sent this test to colleagues in Canada and they uh, attempted to replicate these results. And they did so with very consistent findings, very similar odds ratio, sensitivity, specificity, uh, this is a little over 10 years old. This uh, design, this, this effect has been replicated by a number of different independent groups, suggesting that this test can be used to predict suicide attempts in a range of different settings. We've also seen this effect in the more general population. Uh, we started a website to, to study implicit cognition that anyone can go to and take tests of implicit cognition. It's called Project Implicit Health. And there you can take the test that I just showed uh, implicit association tests having to do with, with depression, anxiety, 
eating disorders and so on. It's a public education site, but it also uh, is, a, it is used to anonymously collect data um, and anyone can go take a test and get a score on their, their implicit associations about various concepts of interest. We posted the test that I, that I just showed and found, we, we collected data from 6,000 people, randomly split that group into groups of 3,000 to, to test our hypotheses and then test the replication and all our hypotheses, hypotheses replicated, all of our effects replicated. We see that people who have made a suicide attempt have higher IIT scores than those who hadn't made an attempt. And I note here that all of these scores are in a negative direction. For this test, it means uh, the more negative, the stronger the association between life and me. So for people who have made a suicide attempt, they have a weaker association between life and me. A positive score here would mean uh, faster response for death in me. That was a really high risk group we saw in the inpatient setting or the, or the emergency setting. So the higher person goes, the, the effectively higher risk of, of suicide attempt. If we look across studies, the more recently someone's made a suicide attempt, the higher their score, suggesting, not showing conclusively, but suggesting that these scores might change over time. And a nice feature of, of this test is, uh, whereas when it was first developed a few decades ago, it was only um, able to be administered on desktops in lab settings, it now can be delivered on any computer, tablet, smartphone. And so we can use this um, out in the field to get pretty quick assessment of uh, people's implicit associations about suicide. And we recently published a brief version of this test. It's only about a minute and a half, about 90 seconds. And we found that it can produce scores that are just as predictive as the slightly longer, the, the standard IT it takes about five minutes. So at only about 90 seconds, it, it, it can be pretty easily used in an emergency or inpatient or, or school or other setting. And thinking of portability brings me to the final thing I wanted to talk about, and that is the need for better data on imminent risk of suicide. So as clinicians, as well as, as, as um, friends, family members, um, coworkers, and so on, what we really wanna know is who is at risk for suicide right now? But what has uh, research told us about the timeline for um, from when we assess someone's risk for suicide until they actually die by suicide. Have we done a good job of identifying short-term or imminent risk factors? Going back to this meta-analysis, what I'm showing here is a, a graphic displaying how much time in the published literature over the past 50 years passes from when we do an assessment until we assess the outcome of suicide death. So from when we measure our predictor until we observe the outcome of interest. Well, in about a quarter of studies, uh, researchers test whether we can predict suicide death over 10 years or longer. In some sense, it's impressive if we can predict a suicide attempt or death 10 years or more out into the future. Practically speaking, though, that's not really actionable information. If it's 2022 right now, and I can tell you which patients or which soldiers or which, which students are going to kill themselves in 2032 or further into the future, Again, impressive, but not really actionable today or tomorrow or, or next month. About a quarter of studies try and predict suicide five to 10 years into the future, about another 30%, one to five years. What percentage of studies have looked at and have identified risk factors in the time window we, we really care about, which is, let's think about a broad window of, of the next four weeks, the next, say, 30 days. It turns out only one-tenth of 1% 1 of studies have done this which means literally 99.9% .9 of all of the analyses that have been done trying to predict suicide have done so in time windows that aren't really clinically useful or clinically actionable. So I think as researchers, we, we've, we've come up short in terms of arming clinicians with what they need uh, to be able to predict short-term suicide risk. So what we need here is studies on the natural unfolding of suicidal thoughts and behaviors out in nature. And I would pause here to note that I think this is why we are so underdeveloped as a science in psychology and psychiatry. We haven't done uh, the work, frankly, that I think a lot of other sciences have done to find some phenomenon out in nature that's a, of importance and just carefully observe it and its properties and, and probe its properties and try and get a better sense of how it acts out in nature. This is how we've come to understand um, planets, uh, ants, chemical reactions, you name it. Pick some area of science where we've seen great advances and it comes from observing something of importance in its, in its setting. What we've done in psychology, for instance, is not that, but we find some construct of importance and then we bring that 
an organism into our laboratory and try and uh, make some proxy for the, the, the environment or the construct of interest, whether it's in a, a behavioral research lab uh, where we want to test whether um, stressful life events or stressful interactions are associated with, with say, depressed mood, anxiety, suicide risk. And so we create some proxy for what happens out in the world. We use brain scanners, we use blood tests, uh, we use eye trackers, but we're not going out into the world and observing how suicidal thoughts actually unfold in real time. The same is true, I would argue, with depression, anxiety, substance use, and so on. In our defense, as researchers, we haven't had the ability to do that. We can't even really experiment on, on, on suicide. We can't bring people ethically into our labs and try and increase their suicidal thoughts or behaviors. And we simply haven't had the tools um, to measure these things as they occur in nature. Until now, I would argue. So over the past decade or so, we've all effectively become cyborgs. We all now are constantly walking around with these digital appendages that are, that are constantly collecting data on us, from us, uh, about us. So we all have these devices that we carry in our pockets or wear on our body in one way or another. And, and wearing them allows us to do what our colleague JP Onella has referred to as digital phenotyping or generating a, a, or doing a moment by moment quantification of the individual level phenotype in situ, in place, out in the wild, using data from people's personal digital devices. So doing this allows us to capture fine-grained dynamic changes in the phenomenon of interest. So we can, we, can, we can measure how do people's thoughts, feelings, behaviors change during a suicidal episode uh, or depressed episode or manic episode or, or, or substance use craving. People are, again, sharing their, their, their brightest, deepest, darkest thoughts, feelings, behaviors with these devices. And we're also producing a, a wide array of, of objective data about ourselves. And so we can, for the first time, really observe what's happening when someone moves in and out of one of these episodes. This greatly decreases the influence of recall bias, uh, of, of asking people to reflect back on when they were thinking about suicide and why that might have been. We can get this information out in real time. This allows us to observe processes, again, out in the wild. We know from, from decades of work in a range of different disciplines that how things operate in a Petri dish or in our laboratory often are very different than how they operate out in the world in an organism. This also allows us to test theories of suicide using ecologically valid data. So we can test a range of existing theories. And so far, in, in quick summary, the moment by moment, hour by hour data we've collected haven't really supported our existing theories. And our theories are actually pretty, pretty silent about how these thoughts emerge, change, how behaviors emerge in real time. Uh, and these approaches allow us to collect never before available data to develop new theories with, with a much better level of precision than ever before possible. And perhaps most importantly, using these moment by moment approaches allow us to not just identify when someone's at high risk, but intervene before the problem occurs, before the suicide attempt occurs. Even with our best interventions, think cognitive therapy, DBT, the best case we have right now is that these interventions decrease the risk of suicide reattempt among those who have already made a suicide attempt. And even then the results are not as, as strong as they could be. And given that around half of people who die by suicide die on their first attempt, we need to do better and using these approaches or not there yet by any stretch, but we may be able to identify people uh, before they become suicidal, before they, they make a suicide attempt and we can intervene in place where they are. This is the goal. Again, we're, we're, we're far from there at this point. So in initial work in this area, a little, a little over 10 years ago, we used the most cutting edge technology available at the time, uh, POMP pilots. We gave them to a sample of adolescents with, um, who were engaging in non-suicidal self-injury or had suicide ideation. And we had them do this, uh, fill out some assessments a few times a day for two weeks. And we learned a little, a little bit about the emergence and, and duration of suicidal thoughts. Around the same time, we did work using the most cutting edge technology at the time, uh, a device called the Life Shirt that people wore under their shirt with a big monitor that, that, that was kept in a big fanny pack. We couldn't get people to wear these for more than a few days at a time. Thinking about advances in technology and how this changes our abilities, we now are all walking around with digital devices. So we don't need to equip people with, with anything in addition to what they have, but we can put apps on their phone and monitor um, 
their thoughts several times a day with their consent. And we've been doing this for the past few years, finding people who say, I have serious thoughts of suicide and asking them four to six times a day to rate their suicidal thinking. We do it using a few simple questions. How intense is your desire to kill yourself? How strong is your intention to kill yourself? How strong is your ability to resist the urge to kill yourself? And in one initial study, this is work led by one of our former postdocs, Evan Kleiman, who's now a professor at Rutgers, we wanted to understand the variability of suicidal thinking. So we found about 50 people who said they're having serious thoughts of suicide, and we asked them those three questions several times a day over a one month period. We want to understand the variability in suicidal thinking. And here's what we observed. These are the data for those people. Each box is a different person. On the vertical axis is the passage of one month of time. On the horizontal axis is effectively the summation of those questions from the prior page with the resist the urge item reverse scored. And what you see here is there's a lot of variability, I think both across people and within people. Whereas this person has pretty low ratings, so other people are more jagged in their ratings. What we did is, is well, me being an older person suggest, suggested that we, we print these out, put them on the floor and stare at them for a few hours to see, do we see any patterns in these data? And we didn't. Uh, Evan Kleiman then had the, the great idea to do a latent profile analysis to see statistically, are there different types of profiles or, or subtypes of suicidal thinking? And what I'm gonna show you in the next slide is basically the same exact data rearranged in order. And we did see five different, what we might think of as profiles or subtypes of suicidal thinking, distinguished by the mean and variability in suicidal thoughts. So people shown here in green have low mean, low variability in suicidal thinking. Again, these are, these are all from a sample of people who say, I have serious thoughts of suicide. Those in green though had a lot of zeros with some ones and twos and threes and fours, but that was it. Those in yellow, low mean, high variability. So they had periods of more intense suicidal thinking. Those in purple, moderate mean, moderate variability, they were bouncing around the midpoint. Those in red, high mean, low variability. They're never coming down to zero. And then those in blue at the end, high mean, high variability. So they had greater naders in their data. Which group is most likely to have made a recent suicide attempt? Those in red. Uh, this is, of course, just one sample. Will this replicate? We get data from a second sample, did a separate latent profile analysis, and saw the same five profiles, suggesting maybe this is a, a, a robust finding. This is only one month passage of data. What we don't know is do people move from, say, green to yellow to purple to red? Is red the, the group that has the highest prospective risk of suicide attempt? We don't know from these data. And so we're following this up with a larger, um, longer prospective study. We've also done a few other um, papers in this area that I'll describe very briefly. Um, one is looking at the question of, can we use changes in suicidal thinking, variability in suicide ideation during an inpatient hospitalization to better predict suicide during that really high risk post-hospital period? And this is work led by one of our current PhD students, Shirley Wang. And in this study, we looked at about 80 adult inpatients, again, pinged about four to six times per day. And I'll just summarize these findings here. We looked at accuracy in a number of different ways. And the three approaches we looked at are, if we use a baseline model where we do a quick iPad-based assessment, self-report measures when a person comes in the hospital, how well do we do predicting suicide attempt in the month after, similar to the, the approach I described earlier, we can, do, we can do okay, we can do pretty well. What if we use the mean of their self-reports on their smartphone assessments? We do even better. So getting uh, information across hospitalization improves prediction. Third, and finally, what if you use a dynamic model, meaning we're looking at dynamic features, changes in their suicidal thinking from one time point to the next? There we do even better, pretty consistently. And one of the strongest risk factors that emerged was a variable called probability of acute change in suicidal thinking, meaning the probability of a big change from one time point to the next. And so we're now working with clinicians to see if we can um, replicate this finding and start to provide information in real time to inpatient clinicians so they have a sense of people's level of risk of suicide attempt after discharge before that discharge actually happens. In doing this work, we also had the opportunity to try and understand suicidal thinking during the early portion of COVID. So we've been collecting data on suicidal patients via smartphones since, since about 2015. But uh, in this study, we looked at people 
who were collecting data from, from 2019 until the early part of 2020 when COVID-19 had its onset. And we did this with patients presenting to local emergency departments or inpatient units with suicidal thinking. And we followed them for the next six months. And we wanted to measure the suicidal thinking increase during the early pandemic was a big question at the time. We have consent to monitor people's GPS trackers in this work. Uh, and so we noticed, noted, not surprisingly, as the pandemic hit, people stayed in their homes much, much more often. During this time, we have a measure of a self-report of social isolation, and you can see the, the dates here. So this, this vertical line is March 15th, when COVID-19 was declared a national emergency, and you see self-reports of social isolation skyrocketing right around that time. We also see significant increases in suicidal thinking at the same time, and increases in Social isolation predict increases in suicidal thoughts. Interestingly, we see this, we saw this among adults, but not among adolescents. And we have all sorts of, of, of hypotheses for why this might be, but we, we are not able to test these given the relatively small sample here, having to do with adolescents' connectedness um, with, via their devices during the early part of the pandemic. I know this is only during the early part of the pandemic, Later pandemic, we've seen big, big increases in suicidal thinking and, and hospitalizations for adolescents. Our group and many other groups are also doing a lot of uh, work trying to uh, get more objective data from smartphones and wearables and use these to try and improve prediction. Uh, we're looking at passive data from GPS, as I mentioned, accelerometer, call and text data, Bluetooth data to get a sense of um, connectedness to those around you. Um, Looking at GPS trace, for instance, uh, these are data from our colleague JP Onello using his, his BWE passive monitoring app. This is a GPS trace for the same person on two different days. You can imagine this might be a person during an active healthy period, and this might be a, a period of, of depressive episode. In reality, this is one of JP's research assistants, and this is them moving from one day from home to work, uh, going back home, walking their dog. So blue is nighttime, red is daytime. And this is a weekend where they didn't go so far from home. I know this to say, these data in themselves are, are, are certainly not gonna predict suicidal behavior, but they could be used in concert with other forms of data to try and improve prediction. You could see perhaps this more, uh, this more activated pattern being predictive of, of a period of health, this more sedentary period being predicted of a depressive episode if combined with self-reports. These are call and text logs from a number of different patients over a number of days in the hospital with how much they're texting others in this case. Perhaps not surprisingly, we see the more a person is calling and texting with others, the lower the severity of their suicidal thinking, and we're digging into this to get a sense of um, directionality, and also looking at, at, at slightly more sophisticated measures like reciprocity. Is it number of calls or texts, or is it if you're calling someone, is that person calling you back? Is there reciprocity in your interactions? And we hope to have more on that soon. And we're also looking at wearable biosensor data using Fitbits um, related, and related devices. This is um, the Empatica E4 device, which collects uh, information from electrodermal activity, heart rate variability, accelerometer, skin temperature, and so on. Uh, these all get collected continuously. There's an event marker on the device. The person pushes that event marker when they engage in self-injurious behavior, when they have a thought of suicide, and we're building models to try and predict when these button presses occur. In work, this is done with a uh, our colleague at MIT, Raz Picard, and a research scientist in her group, Simon Fedor. What Simon's doing is trying to use these different channels of information, of data, to predict button presses from what from data from today to predict button press tomorrow. And these are AUCs. We can see that so far, electrodermal activity is not doing much. Heart rate does a little bit better. Accelerometer is the best so far. And so we're, we're continuing to, to um, collect data from a sample of 600 people over a six month period during this post hospital period to really try and improve our ability to uh, predict increases in suicidal thinking and occurrences of suicidal behavior. So we can again, try and intervene before these things occur. So overall, we're trying to address gaps in the literature and we're seeing this as potential opportunities for advancement using prediction, uh, or trying to improve prediction using electronic health records and other sources of data, trying to detect and predict suicidal thinking and suicidal behavior using objective measures like the IAT, trying to improve short-term prediction and intervention using mobile devices. There's a number of key challenges I didn't have time to address, such as if we have these risk scores, 
How do we give them to clinicians? How do we present them to patients in ways that aren't iatrogenic? Which assessment, which intervention is gonna be best for which patient? Are, are there heterogeneity of treatment effects? Uh, and what are the ethics of doing this, of monitoring people and, and intervening implicitly or explicitly? Of course, we're all monitored all the time on social media. We do Google searches and that information is used to target us for other, other buys. But uh, what are the ethics of doing this for health reasons uh, as, as part of a uh, healthcare network? So all sorts of um, questions and, and, and lots of work still need to be done. I wanna stop there uh, and acknowledge our very generous funding sources without whom this work would not have been possible. And also acknowledge the, the, the very important contributions of all my collaborators who did the majority of the, the any good thinking and, and, and work um, that was presented here today. And I thank you again for your time and look forward to being able to discuss this in the next session. Thank you.